Education and People Service Leadership Academy. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, I saw a couple of comments in the in the chat about the music today. That is the soundtrack from a, a silent movie called Magic Show. And it was kind of, to me, kind of the build up to the holiday season. So it was. Uh, I saw one comment that said it was kind of creepy. Interesting. So in any event, that's what was soundtrack today. So yes, welcome to yet another Special Education and People Services Leadership Academy. As you know, this these sessions are brought to you in collaboration with the Regional Special Education Network, the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, and of course, the Wisconsin Council of, Administrator, of Administrators of Special Services. My name is Chuck Norton. I'm the RSN, uh, Regional Service Network Director for CESA, CESA 5. Um, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, just a quick touch on Zoom etiquette. We want you to please mute your microphones unless you're asking a question. And certainly we hope there'll be some opportunities for you to jump in and ask questions throughout today's session. We invite you though, however, to keep your cameras on. It's so nice to see your faces and see what's going on and just, it just makes a better, such a better connection. So if you can, if you have bandwidth available, go ahead, turn your, turn your cameras on. As always, has been put in the chat multiple times, please uh, rename yourself beginning with your season number, followed by your first and last names. It really helps us get a pic better picture of what part of the state you're coming to us from. And then also we're excited to have so many of you join us today. We have uh, an agenda packed full of really good information that's gonna expand your leadership skills. And we think, and we always hope that it's very valuable to you. Um, one thing that we want to touch base on a little bit real, rather quickly is um, a survey. And the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction is to develop what, what we call a statewide system, or excuse, statewide supports for continuous improvement survey. Now, in the um, in the uh, reminder email that came out yesterday, there's a, a couple of links in there. There's one link actually to the survey itself. But there's also a link that gives you the background of what that survey is about. So if you have a moment, uh, it's also been added, by the way, both those links have been added to our agenda as well. Click on the uh, background information about what what that the intentions are for that survey but then also then click on the survey itself and by the way you can do that survey uh individually or if you have for example a large group and you can sit down and kind of do a collective response to it and you're able to, to note that either way but ultimately the dpi wants to hear from you uh all stakeholder holders across the state with regard to uh, as they develop a new vision of engaged learners creating a better wisconsin together uh, that information is going to be provided we'll Provide, will be included in a report to the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction Office of State Superintendent, and that will inform that uh, her on how best to advance equitable, transformative, and sustainable educational experiences that develop learners, schools, libraries, and communities in our Wisconsin. So it's a it's a it's a very um, value packed survey that's going to impact really the directions and in, in long term vision of the department going forward. So. Uh, take a moment, look at the background information much more in depth than what I've just shared, but also take a moment to fill, complete that survey. We'd appreciate it. Today's agenda, as a reminder, uh, it, the agenda can be found in the links that were shared with you in the reminder emails. And then also, I believe my uh, colleagues are putting links to it in the chat. Uh, that also includes links to the uh, participant folder, which many of you always ask, do I have access to the slides and resources that are shared? Yes, everything will be included in the folder. So keep that uh that link available to you because a lot of times we we remember some of what we hear, but we always want to go back and reference. So that'll be your reference going forward. Also in that in the agenda today in the folder as well is the parking lot document, and the parking lot document is intended for you to. Um, ask those unanswered questions. Certainly you could put questions in the chat and we try our best to get to those as our sessions move along. But you can also put uh, questions in the chat, I mean, excuse me, in the parking lot document and in the dark parking lot document. Certainly if you want a direct response back, put your contact information in there as well. So we'll reach back when we have a an answer for you. And that document too will serve as a resource for everyone that's uh, attended this session to kind of get those answers to some of those things that maybe you've thought of, but maybe others haven't. So so that would be very helpful. 
quick overview of today's session. We're going to start today with Will Cannon. Thank you, Will. I've already spoken to him this morning. He's online with us now. And Will's going to go over idea fiscal applications and all the challenges and nuanced uh, information with uh, jumping on those this many applications that we're asked to submit in data to as directors of special education or anyone in, in the field of uh, in schools that uh, interact with those systems. So uh, Will's going to go through that. We'll take a short break around 1045, and then we're going to come back and speak with uh, Eva Shaw and Tim Pirenboom with regard to uh, functional behavior assessments. And primarily the big one is, and I hope a lot of you are here anticipating that, the questions that you have with regard to uh, uh, developing an FBA and implementing an FBA. So um, we're looking forward to that, though, that discussion. So with that, I'm going to um, ask my colleagues, is there anything else we need to touch on? I'm seeing head shakes no, so we're good to go. Um, Will, if you're ready to uh, share your screen, we welcome you and we're thankful to have you with us today. Yeah, I'm thank, uh, thankful for being a part of this. Um, my name is Will Cannon. Some of you may or may not have seen my name. Um, can everybody see my screen at this time? Yes, yep, it's All up. Right. Um, I'm a IDA Fiscal uh, Grant Specialist Advance with the Special Education Team. And I typically go over a longer form uh, walkthrough of the IDA application. Um, but typically when I've joined you in the past, that's been in the beginning of the year and the beginning of the fiscal year. So we can go through that walkthrough and kind of experience where we need to go from step by step by, uh, with the IDA application. Right now, we're kind of late in the year and we're um, at within the regards of the IDA timeline. We're in this specific area right here. Um, where the IDA flow through and preschool initial budget should be submitted and we should start talking about tidings. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about those two things. Those are two things that stand out in the timeline and are kind of pressing in the deadline situation right now. Um, in regard to the IDA flow through and preschool initial uh, budget submissions, um, I have uh, sent out emails to all LEAs that have not yet completed initial IDA preschool and flow through budget submissions. Um, this year, I've seen uh, a lot of LEAs that have yet to complete those uh, budget submissions. It's been it's about 86 LEAs that have not. Um, that's a little, little bit on the higher end, but I do understand that there has been some turnover. Um, and I do understand that there has been some, um, you know, new faces and new, new people getting into this type of work and trying to complete these budgets. Um, with that being said, the email that I sent to everybody that have not completed these budgets yet um, included my contact information and bookings information. So if anyone has a question, um, they can always uh, schedule some time with me and I can walk through the entirety of the application with them to make sure that everything is accurate and that they're doing everything that they can to complete it step by step. So normally the uh, the, the deadline is August 30th, but I'm uh, the person that that reviews all LEAs, uh, IDA flow through and preschool budgets. That's 360 plus um, budgets that I'm reviewing and resubmissions and everything like that. So I, I'm giving people a little bit of leeway this year um, so they can have some time to try to get all their ducks in a row. And then if they have any questions or cannot complete their budget, they can reach out to me and I can help them uh, through that, through the completion of that. So that's just where we're at right now. And another thing that's kind of pressing to me um, is the uh, last date for submitting a claim, spending down uh, FY 2021 and FY 22 tidings amounts. Um, that is coming up in two days. Uh, we have reached out to all LEAs that have tidings from 2021, 2022, and tried to, you know, get them to, to submit claims and obligate um, and claim down their tidings amounts from those fiscal years. Um, but I do understand that there are some individuals who aren't, um, who have not been able to, to complete that. Um, let me get this black bar out of the way, if I can. I've always had trouble doing this. <laughs> um, so in the IDA flow through um, um, application and wise grants, I can just walk you through this specific portion to, for you to find out if you have any tidings that's left over. Um, right now I'm in test server. So uh, none of this data is like 100% accurate. I didn't want to call out any LEA specifically in this larger meeting. So I always make sure that we're in the test server. Um, but you would go to IDA, 
and you would go to flow through or preschool, depending on uh, what you believe you have tidings in. It's always good to check both because you might have tidings in both. Um, but again, we've reached out to the majority of LEAs and they've completed this. I just want people to be aware that this is a possibility um, that you might have funds that disappear after November 22nd if you have not um, claimed or obligated these funds for uh, tidings. So go to IDA flow through. And that's under programs. And then hold your breath because sometimes these uh, services take a little bit long. Uh, and then as you scroll to application, you will see under application, you see view edit funding. Um, you click view edit funding. And this is a recent development that we added, and it's been extremely helpful for LEAs to get their uh, information quickly about if they have any unspent tidings or unclaimed tidings. Um, it's the IDA flow through tidings table here at the bottom. Um, right now, again, this is the test environment, so it's not showing any values for this specific LEA, which is Milwaukee. Um, and it says, uh, it gives all the information here step-by-step. Step. So FY uh, 2021, 2022, unspent funds. Uh, this is the tidings amount to be obligated by September 30th, 2023 and liquidated and claimed by not, uh, November 22nd, 2023. Um, the, the real standout here is the November 22nd, 2023 part. You can have your funds obligated all the way and um, up until then. And we need to at least have a claim in and have that those funds liquidated by November 22nd. Um, and then it gives you the amount of tidings claimed between uh, um, July 1st, 2023 and uh, September 30th, 2023. So that's just the timeline between um, the fiscal year of you getting those tidings uh, amounts claimed um, so we can, uh, so you cannot lose funds, right? So, and then you have this portion right here, which is a tidings uh, obligated amount claimed between October 1st, 2023 and um, uh, November 22nd, 2023. So they kind of give you a running total of what you have claimed and what you have obligated. Um, and then the tidings amount remaining is at the bottom. So uh, once again, this is something that I've been getting some questions on and walking some people through um, because it could be a little bit messy when you're trying to claim funds from the previous fiscal year. Um, and so it, it, it helps if LEAs really check this tidings table and uh, make sure that they have all their ducks in a row um, 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 and, and they don't lose any funds. So with that being said, um, just, uh, know for sure that we're, we're following up with LEAs to make sure that they have their applications done and are, are trying to complete their applications and not hitting any brick walls, because I know some of the, some of the people here, um, aren't always the people that complete these budgets and send them to me. Um, but I also know that, you know, it's uh, a possibility that some of the people that are completing these budgets are totally new to this and they don't have any idea what they need to do or what they should be doing. Um, so uh, that's why I try to keep it as open as possible and try to schedule those, uh, those uh, calls with LEAs that I see struggling or haven't submitted a budget yet, or even send those uh, LEAs emails like I did a few days ago um, to let them know that we're here to help and here to walk you through uh, the process if necessary. Um, with that being said, um, I know this was kind of a short crash course of some timelines and some deadlines that we need to, to get done or just ensure that are completed. Um, I wanted to use the, the next 15 minutes or so for any questions that you may have. And I'm also going to provide my information in the link, uh, I mean, in the chat. Um, and that's gonna include my email address, um, the IDA uh, mailbox email address and uh, the bookings um, link. So uh, bookings is a, 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 an option that you can use to talk to me directly. Um, we can schedule about 30 minutes for any session regarding IDA application issues or questions. And um, um, yeah, we can go through that uh, together in a 30 minute meeting to, to get those um, um, issues fleshed out. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause. And if you have any questions, either provide them in the chat or unmute and, and we can kind of talk through some things.
certainly a good time to jump in and ask your questions. I mean, uh, I, I was in a district uh, last year that did not submit their budget for a multitude of reasons till later in the year, but certainly there's got to be uh, several of you that are still kind of working on that. Might have a question about what's, uh, you know, how to shape it and uh, expend it, or do you have uh, any questions with regard to tidings, which are, it's important to check that. You really would, don't want to miss out on the opportunity to uh, commit those dollars to uh, good things for kids. So questions, comments, challenges? And also, I, I totally understand if people aren't comfortable asking some of the questions that they have uh, here. So I, like I said, I'm going to provide my bookings link in the chat. And that's a, a more of a one on one session for us to kind of dive into to your specific topic or your specific concern. Well, we've got one in the chat there. Can you read that one from Brad? Yeah, yeah. It says, what is the timeline for revision slash approvals? I recall the team checking roughly one time per week. Um, is that still the case? Um, the timeline for revisions and approvals is kind of, uh, I, I, I try to check once a week. Uh, I have a, a, to uh, a total day blocked off of my calendar to try to check. Um, but you have to understand that I'm the sole person that's, re you know, reviewing these um applications and budgets um and it's 300 plus leas so uh within that eight hour time frame i try to get through as many as i can um so yeah we do check once a week and if you have any concerns uh and if it feels like it's been over that always feel free to reach out um because i am very flexible uh with uh being able to check individuals budgets but um i do also uh, make sure that we check um the budgets in order of submission so if uh, someone submits their budget before you, obviously we're going to check theirs and uh, approve or review theirs first. Um, I hope that answered your question. If not, Brad, you can go ahead and give a follow-up or certainly the uh, click on your mic and um, go ahead and interact. So awesome. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Brad. Other questions? Well, you mentioned a couple of times, I don't remember when you were, had your screen up there, the booking site, which is a really convenient, nice thing, you know, instead of, uh, you know, having to make a call, an appointment, all that kind of thing, you can go ahead and set aside some time uh, through the, the booking site. Can you give us some more information on accessing that and, and yeah, how easy that I'm, is? Yeah, I'm actually putting the chat, uh, putting the link in the chat right now. Okay. Um, but yeah, I can talk through it a little bit more. I totally recommend individuals to schedule bookings calls that are having trouble. It's a lot easier for me to decipher the issue or talk to you about the issue um, than email because uh, we all live in this virtual slash hybrid space at this time. And it's just easier for me to talk to you face to face and I can share my screen and I can walk you through the entirety of the process, right? Um, some LEAs do still schedule um, via bookings conference calls um, and those are purely, you know, on, on the phone and it's not the same virtual aspect that I really need to dive into your specific issue. So I kind of kind of deter LEAs from doing the conference call portion and, and kind of encourage LEAs to do the uh, virtual call portion so we can share the screen and talk through issues together. And I'm providing that link right now. So. Okay. Yeah, because it's uh, so much easier for you to then pull up their reports. You can you can see it. You know, there's uh, all the questions are going to be answered uh, through that av venue. So having Absolutely. that uh, that Zoom call or that team uh, Microsoft Teams meeting or whatever it might be, where you can share and you can see the data, so much more valuable. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be, um, just to go a little bit more on the bookings call, it doesn't have to be directly related to the, the completion of the application, right? It can be things in wise grants that you want to figure out or things that in, in wise grants that you don't really know. It can, you know, it can literally be anything, but primarily uh, LEA's call to try to get that 30 minute session of the IDA application. If they're missing something, if they're missing a claim, um, an allowable cost situation that they're not sure about, anything like that. And I'm gonna throw the, uh, a link to that information as well in the chat. So the timeline um, page that I initially shared, I'm going to put that in the chat as well because it has um, the IDA flow through and preschool application uh, 
uh, guidance for WISE grants, and it has the um, allowable cost guidelines um, in that link as well. So, do you, do you have access, Will, to the document recently put out by the department with regard to allowable costs for uh, attracting and retraining staff, and how those some of those funds can be, you know, kind of creatively used to further the efforts of districts as they uh, attempt to, um, you know, uh, not only attract quality staff, but just continue to retain them. I know there's uh, expenditures in there, allowable costs that kind of opened my eyes a little bit recently when I went through that. And then I think there's still, I would believe, honestly, I can't be sure that there's still um, maybe not a full understanding of that. Yeah, that's a, a little bit out of my okay. direct yeah. wheelhouse, but I, I do know I could probably find the document. Yeah. Um, but yeah, more so like my my wheelhouse is for how IDA funds can be spent allowably and how you can keep uh, staff with IDA funds. Like one of the creative things that I see LEA is doing is uh, um, paying for uh, licenses for uh, special education um, um, staff. Uh, so like uh, you know SEPA, you can pay for their license via DPA license a DPI license allowable. Um, cost uh, welfare combination. I love to see that because um, SEPAs are sometimes some of the, the lowest paid individuals on the staff and they, they do a lot of a lot of good work and um, I, I, I like to see LEAs using their, their IDA funds to try to retain or try to recruit uh, those individuals. So, Yeah, and possibly one of my uh, colleagues. Uh, it's hard for me to do right now as I kind of manage very, this uh, the the emceeing of the show here today but uh in any event if someone has a link uh a connection to that link to that document it's it's rather lengthy and, and kind of eye-opening as to what those costs are so any other questions comments needs you know i've done this uh twice now and i know uh I've been approached at the federal funding conference and I won't be there this year because I'm having a, a baby. So um, I won't be able to attend. Thank you. Um, but I've held up for questions and asked, you know, if you have any questions and I'll stick around for a little bit. And then they don't ask me until they see me in person at the federal funding conference and I won't have the opportunity this time. So please, if you have questions, feel free to reach out before I go on this paternity leave. <laughs> oh, there's a, well, did you give us a kind of rough idea when that might be? Yeah, it, uh, uh, well, the due date is around, the due date is Christmas. So um, in this late December, I will not be here until probably February or March. So um, get those questions in before I leave. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Congratulations on a Christmas baby, no less. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we're going to keep keep this open for a little bit longer. Uh, I see there's some congratulatory comments in the chat for you as well, Will. Um, any final questions, comments um, with regard to um, fiscal applications and developing your not only you know, not only your uh, IDEA and preschool budgets, but then also, you know, tidings, leftover, you know, the, 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 the material that right now I, what you, what I heard you say, Will, was for the 21, 22 school year, we've got our last claim date available, which, which is going to be done in November 22nd, just before Thanksgiving year. Yeah. So if you need to commit those dollars and in essence, you don't need to expend them, correct? You need to submit the claim, the claim with regard to actually, this is what our commitment is to expend those dollars. And that starts, that's the obligated and claim. The obligated correct. part is, yeah, they need to yeah. be, they need to be cement, cemented in, this is what we're spending this money on. This right. is what we spent this money on. Right. Any questions on that? Because uh, we certainly don't want to see dollars left on the table, as we would say. And uh, if you have them, uh, uh, certainly put them to great use. Of course, we don't want you to be frivolous, obviously. But then again, what you spend does affect your future allocation. So that can also have an effect. Will you have any comment on that, expenditures, and then how that affects uh, future allocations? Um, Rachel is actually the IDA MOE person, but it does factor into maintenance mm -hmm. of effort. And I know if I start talking about that, there will be a lot more questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm not the guy to talk to about that. That's Rachel Zelmer. But um, if you, the maintenance of effort is essentially you want to continue to spend the funds 
that uh, that you have been receiving throughout your entire year of receiving the IDA allocation. And if you go under those funds, then you are in question of maintenance of effort and then your funds can potentially decrease, right? Um, you can go over, but going under is uh, gonna bring you into question of uh, your, your allocation being um, decreased. Um, right. So that's essentially the, the maintenance of effort spiel. Um, but when we start getting into the weeds of it, um, that's a more of a Rachel Zellner question. Yeah. So that said, any questions? Uh, Will's open to any further questions, with the exception of deeper questions in the MOE. But That's right. We have we have quite a team here too that'll try to answer those questions too. But anything else you'd like to ask? Anything in the chat? Do we have something? I thought maybe there was something. Oh, and I, by the way, thank you um, for, to the special education team. I believe that came from. Um, my team in in uh, CS5, Erica. So thank you for that document. With regard to uh, leveraging IDEA funds to attract, prepare, retain special educators and related services providers, allowable costs. So that is in the chat, that document. Check it out. There's uh, a lot of good information in there about how you can uh, maybe use some of your tidings to uh, cover some costs right now. So. Okay. <clears throat> sorry, this is Erica. I did just send that to you to make sure I had the right one. But oh, if it I'm is, sorry. I'll put it in their chat for everybody. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't notice it was a direct message. Thank you, Erica. Yes, that is the, that is the document I was referring to. Thank you. I do want to say one thing before I go. Um, I do yeah. appreciate the the grace that uh, individuals have given me in, um, when I tell them that I'm approving and reviewing all 300 plus LEAs. Um, people have been very receptive of uh, trying to work around my schedule and understanding that their uh, uh, IDA budget um, review is not instant. Um, so yeah, um, just thanks to everybody for allowing that grace and, and being able to work with me and uh, not against me because we, we, we know that we just want to get this completed and done accurately. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you, Will. And by the way, that's you said that's all districts across the state that you yeah. review all those budgets. Yeah. That's a yep. big responsibility. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly wouldn't want to do the, like uh, Madison Metropolitan School District or uh, or, or, or Yeah, Milwaukee. Their, their budgets can get a little bit lengthy and yeah. um, the returns can, you know, can happen frequently and you get into those back and forths that, you know, uh, would just end up resulting in the call and getting it all squared away. So um, yeah. again, thanks for to everybody for being so, um, you know, generous with that. I appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Yes. Thank you too for uh, being, being here with us today. So last call for questions. Looks like we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but we're just going to give you a little extra time. We'll probably bump our next presentation up a little bit if we can, but last, last call for questions. Well, Will, we certainly appreciate your time. Um, your contact information has been shared. So certainly, as Will has pointed out many times, sometimes it's hard to ask those questions amongst a rather large crowd. We've got 90 people with us today. Um, but certainly reach out directly or take advantage of that scheduled time to uh, put together a booking. And you can actually sit down, uh, share your share your budget with Will, take a look at it, you can take a look at your tidings cost, all those kinds of things, and get creative and, and make sure you meet those deadlines. Again, that deadline for the tidings piece is coming up just before th and Thanksgiving break. So you got two more days. And then we've, uh, please, uh, you know, even though the August date is expired with regard to IDEA and preschool budgets being uh, submitted, I appreciate him uh, being understanding, Will, you being your understanding and your grace to districts across the state with regard to, um, you know, making some opportunity for those coming in a little later than expected. So we certainly appreciate that. Team, um, I'm going to ask my, the rest of my team, uh, should we take a break now? We're a little bit ahead of time. We're about 15 minutes ahead. Um, and what would yeah. you think? Go ahead. I, hi. Yeah. So I asked, I actually was able to reach out to Tim and Eva and they were able to jump on some, if, unless folks need a break, I say, let's just move forward and see how these questions go. And then if maybe if we need a break with Tim and Eva, we can take one if there are a lot of questions. Okay. All right. Does that Sounds work? Good. Yeah. I, I think so. so much, Will. Yeah. yeah thank thanks, you. Will. And congratulations and enjoy yeah. the next few weeks and months are going to be a challenge, but most Accelerating, and we we really uh, we congratulate you. All right, I appreciate it. Take care, guys. Thank Bye. You. 
So that being said, I, I really want to, again, thanks Will for being with us and, and everyone in the call today, the understanding that uh, some of these things are, you know, we do our, our best to project the amount of time needed for various things, but it can ebb and flow. So that being said, I want to welcome Eva Shaw and Tim Perenboom. Tim, it's been a little bit, actually Friday since we've seen each other. Um, so welcome to the to our, our space. Um, certainly go ahead and share your screens. We're going to switch gears now to uh, functional behavioral assessments and primarily the, the questions that come along with it. And hopefully everyone here has uh, has several of those uh, in waiting for you. Are, are we sure we don't need a break? Were you just talking special ed budgets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that is a good time for a break. But <laughs> If, if you guys we want to take a five minute yeah. break, that's fine with me. We I just want to respect people's time. So. I mean, even I don't need a break. We just got here. But like yeah. I said, we weren't we weren't talking special ed budgets. <laughs> Should we roll for, forward, Aaron? I'm just wondering if someone in the chat wants to speak up. I don't want to make assumptions on behalf of the of okay. the group. Yeah. We can certainly take a five or ten minute break, everyone. Folks on the call. One point. One point. Okay. We've got to keep moving forward. Rachel spoke up. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Well, we'll keep, we'll jump in then. Um, I'm Eva Shaw. I'm a consultant on the special education team at DPI. Um, and I'm with Tim, who's the school psychology mm -hmm. consultant. <laughs> and, and was, and was muted. Hi everyone. I'm Tim Perry. I'm the school psychology consultant. Yeah. And um, we're going to be talking about the updated bulletin 2301 and FBAs. Um, we reviewed a lot of the questions that were submitted in the survey. There were over 30. And in the next little bit of time, we're going to try to address those questions through this slide deck. And um, if we don't get to uh, a question that you had, I know there's that parking lot. You can always put it in there and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Um, you know, not all the questions had a really easy answer. Um, they never do when it's special education, but we're going to move forward and try to answer as many as we can. So like I said, the, uh, a lot of this is based on the updated bulletin that was just published, I think maybe in September, um, uh, bulletin 2301. And that bulletin is all about the um, required consideration of positive behavioral interventions and supports, um, as well as functional behavioral assessments. So we will just jump right into um, some of the questions. So um, one of the things we were asked about was the special factors page, you know, and as we know that if the team determines um, that a student's behavior impedes their learning or that of, or that of others, um, if their behavior impedes their learning or that of others, that the IEP team has to consider the use of positive behavioral interventions and supports excuse me, that the child needs in order to receive FAPE. <clears throat> um, and they have to be documented on that special factors page. It has to describe the behaviors that are impeding learning. And then they also have to um, include specially de designed instruction, supplementary aids and services, related services and or program modifications and supports in the program summary. Um, IDEA does require the use of uh, specially designed instruction related services and supplementary aids and services so that the student can make progress towards goals and um, the general education curriculum, as well as being um, educated and participate with other students. Um, additionally, considering the supplementary aids and services that a child needs should take into account the academic extracurricular and non-academic environments available to and of interest to the child. So IDEA requires uh, that IEP teams consider the use of positive behavioral interventions and supports. They have to consider the number and type of positive behavioral interventions and supports, and they, those um, numbers and types will vary greatly depending on that particular student and their needs. IEP teams need to look at all of the factors that contribute to the student's success, including relationships, environmental supports, the adult approach, et cetera. 
um, universal strategies should be included in the IEP if its use is related to a disability related need or an IEP goal. And there was a specific question about that. Um, as an example, why not a positive behavioral intervention or support? Um, if you think about something like speech to text, that is generally available to all students. Um, so students with an I, a student with an IEP that may have a disability related need um, in writing, and that student requires the use of speech to text, it has to be included in the IEP. Um, another, uh, if the student didn't have that disability related need or a goal related to writing, then the team might not necessarily need to include speech to text, speech to text as a supplementary aids or service. Um, another example may be like check in, check out. A lot of districts and schools use that, use that as a tier two intervention. Um, so if that's available to all school students, but a student with an IEP thrives on the ability to touch base with a trusted adult each morning to set up their school day, then check in, check out should be included in that student's IEP. <clears throat> I just lost my screen. Okay, oh, um, sorry about that. Uh, then um, for the prompt on that special factors page, uh, we had a couple of questions about um, the prompt about using, it has a functional behavioral assessment been conducted. That, that prompt was included so that IEP teams consider, can, can consider whether or not an FBA may be needed or appropriate, it's uh, it's not required, except in those circumstances in which it is, and Tim will get to that, like a manifestation determination or the second use of seclusion or restraint. Um, when IEP teams are looking at this prompt, they have to be careful not to retroactively apply um, and say yes, you know, saying yes, and then do an FBA. You know, it's, it's don't mark, Yes, unless that FBA has already been conducted or um, it was embedded in the student's previous IEP, which we'll get to next. Um, in cases of seclusion and restraint and manifestation determinations, uh, this is also a section of the IEP where the team can clearly document that they have met all of the legal obligations, um, specifically meeting required timelines. And we have a very lengthy guide, that guide to special education forms but you can you know, um, skip sections, obviously. But if you want some more additional information about this prompt on the special factors page, just go to page 132 on that guide to special education forms. <clears throat> um, there was a question asking about if IEP teams could write into an IEP um, that FBAs or portions of an FBA um, could be included in the IEP as part of that collaborative problem solving process. And, you know, absolutely. Um, and just to kind of think about the CCR IEP five step process, root cause analysis is already part of that process in step two um, when we're identifying effects of disability and disability related needs. Um, you know, when we're doing that, they have to consider that root cause of areas of concern to help explain the why. So you don't always have to dig in and do a full FBA to do root cause analysis. You can do that as part of the CCR IEP five-step process. Um, also, you know, part of the five-step process is to analyze progress. And it would certainly be appropriate for the IEP team to determine that they want to use observation and interviews and maybe rating scales and some of those things that we would generally um, consider as part of an FBA and embedded that, that into the student's annual IEP. Um, it's really similar to the guidance that we provided in the frequently asked questions about the emotional behavioral disability rule change. Um, we made a similar suggestion that if IEP teams want to embed some of the things that are part of that, the required um, the requirements for the EBD rule, embed those into the IEP so that if, you know, so that when you get to that three-year reeval, you already have all that data collected with those required interviews and observations and rating scales. Um, so it's certainly appropriate to embed some of that work into that annual IEP process. 
And like I said earlier, the root cause is already part of that process. So you can dig in and really get to the why the student's having difficulty through this process without ever going into that formal FBA. And, and Tim's going to um, provide some more information about digging into that FBA process. Gonna pause briefly. I know I see there's a parking lot document in the chat, um, but just gonna pause briefly, make sure no one needs any clarification to this point before I start getting into a little more specifics about um, FBAs and some of the questions that came specifically about that. And there was a question about sharing the slide deck and absolutely I can share this with Aaron or Deb and I'm sure they can drop it in the folder or whatever they need to do, but I will make sure that we share a copy of that. Yeah. Um, so, oh, oh Tim, sorry. this is Aaron. I can, yeah. I can drop in the um, question that was in the parking lot that was added. Uh, let me know if you can see that or I can read it. If a student has an emotional behavior disorder um, and an FBA BIP is needed, does that mean you can also, does that mean you also have to look at the EBD criteria? Can you do the FBE VAL and add a plan without looking at criteria? That is a very good question, yeah. and that is, <laughs> um, and I would I would say this: if you're doing, if you're, well. Can we, that's a great question. Can we pause a second and get through this next section with Tim and then we'll come back to that question? Yeah, absolutely. There, there was a very similar one that was already in the questions that went around earlier. So, okay, yep. so um, yeah, so we will hopefully kind of get to that. Um, just to, as a spoiler, I will tell you, I don't know that we have a real specific answer. Um, we are, um, working with our special ed compliance team on, on what the answer to that is. Um, so we'll give you a, a, as clear of an answer as we can at this point um, once we get to that part of uh, what we're talking about this morning. And, and by the way, Tim, that, that's precisely what our parking lot document's all about. It's those mm -hmm. questions that maybe we don't have clear answer on right now, but we can certainly add to it later on. So those that are in, in attendance today, throw your questions in the, in the chat as well as the parking lot. And then um, with a little more research and keep an eye on that, we will uh, have some more clear answers and, yeah. uh, embedded in that document soon. Yeah. So we so Eva talked a little bit and addressed some of the questions that we got. Then this next section, we we're going to try and answer like the big question, um, which is when it comes to FBAs and how they fit within a multi-level system of support or our big sort of systems level stuff, we get questions about, well, what about a brief FBA? Um, so we've in this document and just in general, we do tend to get questions about, well, how do we do tier two or three interventions if we have to do an evaluation whenever there's an FBA required? Um, can we do sort of tier two interventions and FBAs within that or this this idea of brief FBA? Um, somebody made a comment about, you know, not being clear about how simple FBAs or, or what the PBIS um, National PBIS Center refers to as brief FBAs, like where does all that fit in? Um, so the first thing to sort of think about um, is that if you look at the National PBIS Center, you know, they do say that even for a brief FBA, you, you should or you need to get parent consent to do those. Um, our guidance, as you're all aware of, um, since you read this prior to um, our session today is is there's this question that is in our comprehensive special education evaluation bulletin, which was published in early 2021, um, which asked this specific question. If we're going to do an FBA, does it for a student who already has an IEP, does it need to be part of a special education reevaluation? Um, so since that publication, even, and I don't know exactly what the timeline was when we sort of updated the the part of the response that comes after yes. Um, but we did update that response that an FBA is still considered part of an evaluation, uh, depending on the purpose. If the purpose is to look at the nature, serve, nature and extent of that student's services or their continued special education eligibility. So going back to that 
uh, emotional behavioral disability and FBA is needed? Do you need to relook at the eligibility criteria? Um, you know, this does say or, but IDEA does say the purpose of an evaluation is to identify whether or not a student has a disability and identify their need for specially designed instruction. Um, so there's some some confusion there. I understand where that that question comes from. But, um, you know, if you just look at the short answer to this question, yes, an FBA does need to be part of an evaluation. Um, when the purpose is to determine the nature and extent of a student's needs. Uh, or their placement in special education. So uh, put a pin in that if you're sort of freaking out going, oh my gosh, we do FBAs all the time on a smaller scale to just work through our PBIS or our multi-tiered system of support uh, as our student solve problem solving process. So sort of put a pin in that for a second and we're gonna talk about why the answer to this is yes. Um, there are three main things that we sort of think about when we think of functional behavior assessment. Uh, one is that uh, what is the intent or likely outcome? So if the purpose of, and I'm going to set the term FBA aside for a second, if the purpose of your assessment procedure or your problem solving process, if your intent or the likely outcome is going to be to change a student's services in their IEP or change their, or potentially change their placement, potentially change their label, uh, things like that, and it's a student that already has an IEP, well, then the answer is yes, that parent get has procedural safeguards through those processes. They need to be involved. They need to give you their consent um, for doing those assessment procedures and those processes. Um, a phrase I use pretty regularly is if you're really going to be digging into the heart and mind of a kid, um, which is essentially what an FBA is. You're trying to see what the function of their behaviors is. You're trying to figure out what's making them tick. If you're going to be doing those things, parents get to know what you're doing and why. Um, you might be asking some pretty, uh, for lack of a better word, like invasive questions about that kid's background, about what life is like for them outside of school and in their community. Um, what sort of development, what's their developmental history? Those are things that parents need to know what you're asking and why. Another way to think about it in terms of procedural safeguards is if you think about the more sort of extreme, uh, extreme wrong term, intense behaviors, um, significant behaviors, um, and you think, well, we're just going to do an FBA or a brief FBA uh, to figure out what supports this student needs, and you're looking at anything, even if it's as simple as like impulsive behaviors, and you don't do that through a formal IEP or evaluation process, and that student gets in a fight in the hallway, and suddenly they are up for a disciplinary change of placement, um, that if that parent wasn't given those procedural safeguards before, they might have serious cause for asking questions about, if you were doing these behavior checklists and observing my student across these different environments, um, and you're asking me these questions about my kid's developmental history, um, one, um, shouldn't that have been a more formal process? And two, it gets to point number three here. At what point should you have thought this might be due to that student's disability? And that's really where the special education evaluation comes in. If you are doing these really formal, really wide ranging assessments of a student's social, emotional and behavioral functioning, um, at what point are you not meeting your child find obligations if you are thinking, we need to do this really in-depth assessment and analysis of the student's behavior. So those are sort of the three key reasons why FBA really does need to be part of this evaluation process. Um, and just to give you sort of another way to think about it, when we talk about functional behavior assessment, um, actually, I'm going to pause here. And based on sort of some of the things that I just sort of described, I'm going to pause here and get a sense for, in the chat, can you just throw in some specific observable behaviors that you consider to be, uh, again, for lack of a better term, FBA worthy? Like what behaviors would you see that you would think, I want to do a function, or we need to do a functional behavior assessment? Certainly, everyone can think of some behaviors that they're challenged with. <laughs> that uh... <laughs> repeated aggression towards other students. 
Oh, here we go. Physical Eloping. aggression towards people yeah. or objects. Fleeing. Elopement. Much like fleeing. Repeated significant safety concerns. School avoidance. Physical or verbal aggression. All right. Elopement. Yelling or bothering other students. Um, throwing chairs. That is uh, a common one. Chronic defiance, physical or verbal aggression. All right. So inappropriate touching of peers. Um, all very good examples um, of what I would say are behaviors that interfere with the student's learning or the learning of others. The other common theme in there, uh, stress response behaviors that impede engagement and activities um, that interfere with learning and learning of others. The other theme in there is safety, right? Um, so that sort of gets us to, there's a reason why um, when we talk about FBAs, we're going to get to sort of what the definition of, of functional behavior assessment is. And if you look at that bulletin and just sort of go through it from top to bottom and just scan through it, it is a it is sort of lined up in a sequence of RTI or multi-level system of support problem solving processes, right? You start with sort of the least invasive sort of uh, lower level, we have this data, we see an issue, we're going to try some interventions, and then it gets more and more specific in terms of figuring out what the behavior is, what the root cause of the behavior is, what the function of the behavior is, and how we need to address it. So with all these behaviors that you listed, um, there's a few things to think about. One, if you see those behaviors and you're going to do a functional behavior assessment, what's the likely outcome of that assessment for behaviors such as room clearing, frequent fleeing of the classroom, refusing to come to school, the likely outcome is probably going to be a pretty significant shift in services and supports. Um, and to do that, to dig into those behaviors, to try and get to the function of the root cause, parents should have the ability to say, yeah, I, I'm on board with this level of assessment. I see it too. I need to be involved in this process. I get to sign off on what assessments you're doing, et cetera. And if you think about these types of behaviors, leaving the classroom, physical aggression, repeated physical aggression, throwing chairs, um, a potential disability is certainly at the top of my list in terms of what might be the cause of that level of behaviors. All right. Um, so again, when thinking about functional behavior assessment, or I'm going to shift again and say, when thinking about an assessment or problem solving process, some things you want to think about in terms of that assessment process is what are the frequency, intensity, complexity of the behaviors? What have we already done to support this student? Again, these are sort of all multi-level system support, RTI kind of processes, the efficiency of the problem solving process and the resource allocation. If I go to the uh, doctor and say, I have a headache, they don't immediately jump to, well, you need brain surgery, right? The, they're going to say, you know, drink more water, try some diet and exercise. Let's adjust your, um, let's a, adjust your physical activity. Let's uh, make sure you're getting good sleep. Try some Tylenol. They're not going to jump right to more significant invasive type things. It's basic sort of RTI multi-level um, systems support processes, right? How, what are other ways that we are identifying student needs? That's that CCR IEP process. That's the evaluation process. Um, so shifting to some other questions. Uh, in Wisconsin, so there are only two times where we are required or IEP teams are required to conduct an FBA. Uh, one is as part of that manifestation determination that's been around for a long time. I think people are pretty familiar with that. If the behavior that results in a disciplinary change of placement is found to be a manifestation of the student's disability and an FBA hasn't already been done, the team does need to re uh, conduct an FBA. The other one um, is seclusion and restraint, which is newer, um, but it is a, a few years old at this point. Since 2019, a student with an IEP who's been secluded or restrained twice in one school year um, the team needs to review the IEP. The IEP must include positive interventions based on an FBA of the behaviors of concern. So again, that's a scenario where if an FBA has not been done, 
uh, the team does need to conduct one. Another question, I know we get this kind of uh, pretty regularly. I don't recall if this or something near to it came up in the, the document that you all filled in with questions, but we also get, wait, if you're telling us to do a functional behavior assessment um, and the team, when it, after that second seclusion restraint has to meet within 10 days of the incident, are you telling me that we have to do an FBA in 10 days? Um, the answer is no. Um, we certainly recognize and acknowledge that you cannot do an adequate FBA in 10 days, especially if you're thinking about disciplinary change of placement where a student might not even be in school for a good chunk of those 10 days. Um, that what, what the FAQ um, says in terms of this is make sure that you meet within those 10 days to review and revise the IEP because at a minimum, you have two new, hopefully decent data points, which are the two incidents of seclusion or restraint. And you have documentation of the debriefing that's required and the seclusion or restraint report that's required. So you do have at minimum two decent data points, especially if you've done that debriefing and documenting that's required in Act 118 well, um, you have some good data points and some good information from team members that can give you a decent sense of sort of the behavioral triggers, how the team responded and things like that for how to address that behavior. And then the team needs to consider, did we do a functional behavior assessment or not? And if you didn't, that would be a time to start the reevaluation process, to start that FBA process, to go more in depth, to address the behaviors while you have those um, those updates, those review, those new strategies, those new supports from that review revised that happened within those 10 days. So get it started within those 10 days. Chuck, you're raising a... <laughs> I was just going to say, I appreciate that clarification because I've get that question quite a bit. That 10 day window can be really tough to meet. So I appreciate the explanation. What I'm hearing is have that IEP meeting within the 10 day frame, talk about new, new, new behaviors and the reasons that you really need to conduct that FBA, start the wheels in motion. That way you can meet the, 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 the requirement. However, it's not, not, possible generally in some cases to have that FBA complete, then re reconvene at a later date to process that information as well. Yeah. I mean, if you ask the school psychologist in me and any, and really any school psychologist who does FBAs frequently or school social workers or whoever, um, yeah, it's pretty unrealistic to think that you could do a, a, a decent FBA in 10 days. Particularly, even if it's if particularly if it's a student that you don't have direct access to, and uh, and so forth. But yeah. great qualifications. I do want to mention that we've got a good number of questions already building up. I, I really want to get uh, both Tim, you, and Eva's view on. Um, there's a few in the chat, and there's a few in the in the in the uh, parking lot document. Want to wait to jump on those, or we want to go through them as we're going along? Uh, let's wait. We don't have a lot of formal stuff to go through. Okay. So um, I see the one in the chat about refusing consent for the FBA. Yeah, we can. We'll. Uh, we can certainly address that one. Um, but let's keep going because. Okay. Um, I think a lot of them are probably similar to the ones that have already been submitted, and hopefully we touch at least touch on some of them. And then if we need to clarify towards the end, we can certainly do that. All right, so you don't need to do it within 10 days, but but get it going in those cases of seclusion and restraint. Um, the next question is, you know, how, uh, how do we conduct an FBA? So we had some questions about strategies for data collection in the FBA, um, tools and guidance on how to conduct an FBA, um, writing usable functional FBAs. Um, so I wanna to touch on a couple of things related to that. Um, if you look at, again, that FAQ and when even I talk to groups about FBAs and sort of a more formal sort of training and information sort of setting, what we really try and emphasize is uh, in addition to sort of the very traditional functional behavior assessment where you're looking at antecedent behavior consequences and then maybe setting events, um, we're trying to make sure we don't focus on just the student. Um, that you're not just sort of putting the student under a microscope and um, or doing some observation of the students to count the number of things that student does wrong, and then sort of guessing at the function of the behavior in terms of 
what do we need to fix within the student based on this count of how many times they ran out of class or how many times they're aggressive towards peers. What we're really trying to encourage teams to do is really look at the bigger picture. Um, look at um, the influence of um, the, the environment around them, the students' um, cultural background, um, things going on in the community, things that we can adjust in the, in the environment, uh, particularly in the school environment. How can we um, address the adult practices? So really thinking about setting events, antecedents, consequences, all those things that are outside of the student and making sure you're assessing those as part of the assessment as well, because those contribute greatly to whatever ultimately the team lands on in terms of the function of the behavior. It is not always internal to the student what the function of the behavior is. In fact, it's often not. Our behaviors as adults um, um, are influenced by the things around us. The same is true for kids, even more so, however, because kids do not have the fully developed brains that uh, uh, adults do, or at least most of us adults do. Um, so one tool um, that can be helpful, one big broad tool that can be helpful is thinking about FBAs through the context of, and we don't have a slide for it, but Bronfenbrenner's ecological model, where it does look at the interplay between all the different influences on a student's behavior in different spheres of influence. So from the things closest to the student to things as broadly as sort of our societal and cultural values and rules and norms and laws and institutions. Um, more specifically, this riot ISIL matrix is, um, is an excellent tool to sort of help frame out what you need to look at through your FBAs. Um, and it sort of speaks to the idea that we're not just zeroing in on the student, counting the number of things they're doing wrong and figuring out how to fix whatever's wrong with the student. Um, we really wanna make sure that we're using these different assessment practices, reviewing, so looking through files, uh, looking through behavioral records, academic records, um, social emotional history, things like that through the lens of instruction, curriculum, environment, and learner, interviewing different people, observing in different environments. And again, not just observing the student, but observing the environment that is around the student. So different classrooms, things like that. And then testing uh, as well. Those are things like standardized reading scales and, and other kinds of assessments. So making sure, again, that we're not just zeroing in on the student, counting the things that they do wrong, and figuring out what incentive we can throw at them to get them to stop doing that thing wrong. We know that that's not how behavior works in humans. So we need to make sure that we're really also focusing on the environment and the things going on around them. Um, so we also got a few questions about, well, how are we doing this data gathering? Um, what role does the school psych play? What about the case manager? Uh, classroom teacher, things like that. Um, can we be more clear in the bulletin about um, legal requirements of a functional behavior assessment and what um, what is more guidance that's coming from us? So to sort of answer those questions, um, we are starting to develop more specific guidance. It won't be added into that behavior bulletin, but it'll sort of be an expansion of that by updating our current FBA toolkit. Um, and one of the things we're, we're working on sort of starting with is what are the steps of a functional behavior assessment? So in our more in-depth um, conversations about functional behavior assessment, what we, what we mentioned is that IDEA or anywhere else federally, even in the regulations, there's no definition of what functional behavior assessment is. Um, there's also no definition in what functional behavior assessment is in our state laws. Um, and that can make it really hard when we're being told, here are times when you have to do an FBA, seclusion and restraint and manifestation determination, when no one tells us what that is. Um, and it also makes it challenging for a lot of the questions that have been coming from you in terms of well, what about during our tier two and tier three problem solving processes? Can't we use FBA or brief FBA for that? That's hard to answer when there's no clear specific definition of what an FBA is. Um, so hopefully the next couple of slides and um, some discussion, and as we start to develop um, up or update our, our FBA toolkit, that will become more clear. 
Um, so again, steps in conducting an FBA, um, you establish that team, making sure that it involves parents, caregivers, and students, um, that you're specifically defining the target behavior, and then you go through the data gathering process. So again, this is a pretty, um, pretty uh, invasive sort of process. It's an in-depth process where we're really trying to get at all the factors that might be contributing to a student's behaviors or the times when that behavior is not occurring. So that's an important part of this data gathering as well as that we're thinking about collecting data about times when the behavior that, that is of concern um, or that is challenging us is not occurring because there are clues to not only student strengths, but things going on in the environment that are um, not contributing or not triggering that behavior or contributing to that behavior not happening. Um, so important, again, that we're collecting data on these ecological factors, uh, student strengths and preferences, what the consequences of the behaviors are. Um, that's sort of the meat and potatoes of the FBA is that data gathering process um, on that specific target behavior. Then the teams identifying the likely function of the target behavior um, and then determining next steps, which could be an update to the IEP. It might be initial eligibility for special education and the development of an initial IEP. Uh, if uh, the student is determined to not be eligible for special education or not have a need for specially designed instruction, um, there are other ways to sort of use that data and use that information to address behaviors. So Eva is going to take it from here to talk yeah, about just, what do we yeah, do with that data. And we just have a couple more slides and then we'll um, jump into all the questions if we haven't answered them. Because a lot of what we're sharing is kind of embedding hopefully answers into those questions that were in that survey. Um, so there were a couple of questions about the results of the FBA. And under IDEA, you know, the primary vehicle for providing FAPE is that IEP. Um, and the findings of the FBA would be incorporated into that IEP process. So the, re results, of the, the results of the FBA obviously would provide you, uh, the IEP team with that hypothesis um, of the root cause or the function of the behavior, you know, trying to get below that surface level concern and digging in and really getting to the why that's happening. And like we've said, you know, even starting back at special factors and using root cause then or the functional behavioral assessment and using the function and root cause now, it's really about getting deeper than just what's wrong with that student, but looking at all those relationships and everything around them, around that student and really looking at their, um, you know, their response to uh, those relationships in the environment and, and providing support. Um, we would get, we would use the results of that FBA to really, we'd have some great baseline data because of the data that we just collected, which would allow us to um, set the baseline and then also to help us establish a level of attainment and measure progress. Um, it helps us to better match the evidence-based improvement strategies to that student's needs. So we're not just, you know, randomly selecting, we're really looking at that why and then trying to match that evidence-based um, improvement strategy. And it really helps identify those ecological factors um, and context and supports to better meet that student's needs. So if we're looking specifically at the IEP, um, you would certainly want to include all of that data into the present level of academic achievement and functional performance. You'd want to describe those situations, settings, adult behavior, relationships, all those factors that you've identified that either positively or negatively influence that behavior um, and incorporate all of that information into that present level um, and all that data as well. You'd include that information. You'd include the description of the behavior that's interfering with learning or learning of others in that special factors, um, as well as use it to determine the effects of disability you know, what you see, what you hear, and then the why, and then establishing those disability related needs. Um, and then all of that great information is going to help you determine the services outlined in that program summary. So you take all that great information and determine what do we need for supplementary aids and services. And if they're universal, but that child has a disability related need related to that universal, they're incorporated into supplemental aids and services. 
All that great information would help you to determine what kind of emerging skills or developing skills or unmet needs do we need to develop goals for and specially designed instruction um, related services, as well as perhaps some program modifications and supports for school personnel. Maybe there's some training we need to engage in to better meet the needs of that child. Some staff training, some staff collaboration time. And then finally, the question about behavior intervention plans. Um, you know, sometimes the IEP team will determine they need um, more information than what can be included in an IEP and will develop that uh, BIP. The BIP isn't required um, except in circumstances of that manifestation determination when it's determined that the conduct um, that led to that review was a manifestation. Then a BIP is required. But other than that, a BIP isn't. And a lot of that information should be included in that IEP. Um, the BIP can, again, just help you with some more details around maybe some staff approaches. Um, you know, maybe there's a staff response plan in which we really need to outline staff behavior when dealing with a student who is, you know, reacting to some environmental trigger. Um, if the IEP team does determine that they want a, that a behavior intervention plan is needed, then it has to be really clearly documented in IEP that there is a behavior intervention plan attached. And then we did have a question about, you know, where can we get some support for students who are demonstrating some pretty significant behavioral output? And a great place to start is always that regional, you know, your RSN, reach out to your CISA and, and start there. We have um, just, uh, it's a set of documents. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't necessarily be super helpful if you have a student, you know, in the moment really experiencing some um, concerns but we have the inclusive strategies to address the behavioral needs for students with IEPs. And that really can um, help with kind of thinking about adult um, bias, adult practices when dealing with students who have behavioral needs. And uh, it's a whole set of documents with reflection and application activities. And then I'm gonna shamelessly promote a grant that I um, oversee, the Supporting Neurodiverse Students Professional Learning System is a great support um, not only do they do learning events around the state, but they also, if you are having um, concerns with, um, you know, particular situations, uh, you can reach out um, the second bullet, that training, technical assistance, and coaching, and um, the grant coordinator, Katie Berg um, or Risa Hawes, they're available to help brainstorm and problem solve around specific um, circumstances. They can never be part of an IEP team. Um, but they can help adults really reflect on their practice and their approach when dealing with students who um, present with behavior that really significantly challenges us. And then if we go to the next slide, this is just some resources on FBAs. Um, like Tim said, we are in the process of updating our FBA uh, information. Um, we're trying to dig in and update that so it better aligns with all the good information we have. Um, a firm has some good information. Ocali has some great information. Um, the ALSUP, the Lives in the Balance, that's also being updated soon. Um, instead of assessment of lagging skills, they're going to be changing it to the assessment of emerging skills. Um, but that's a good resource as well. And then OSUP has some information too. So there's a lot of resources and, and we certainly recognize that, that it takes a lot of time and energy to dig into this, but there, there is help there for you. And then finally, we just have uh, on the last slide, we just have some evidence-based intervention resources um, to help kind of dig into what kind of um, uh, evidence-based interventions might match that student's needs when you're digging in through that FBA. So I, like I said, I will make sure I get this slide deck to Deb and Aaron and they can put it in that um, folder for everyone so you have these. And then we'll get out of the slide deck and then just take a look at some of the questions that maybe we didn't get to. Awesome. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'm going to also drop in the chat just to make it easy for you rather than having one of us kind of bumble and mumble our way through. Um, yeah, I've put a link to the parking lot. So certainly there's some questions, Tim and Eva, in the uh, chat right now, and then also a link to that parking lot document, which last I checked at four or five in there. All right. Well, I don't know how we want to tackle these, Tim. I'm going to start with that first question about any student, really. It wouldn't matter if their um, disability category was emotional behavioral disability or other health impaired or autism or anything. 
the question about whether or not we need to um, take a look at criteria when you're doing a functional behavioral assessment. Certainly, if you want it to be considered that three-year reeval, you would want to address criteria. And if you're digging in that deep, you might, you know, it might serve you well just to go ahead and, and readdress criteria. That's not an uh, that's not an official answer. I'm just saying that might be a good practice to engage in when you're um, already digging that deep with a functional behavioral assessment. Am I looking at the right parking lot with these things dated like from mid-August? Go down, scroll down. It's 1120. There's <laughs> something today. Yep. Yeah. Scroll all the way to the bottom. All the way to the yeah, bottom. I just there hadn't go. refreshed yet. Got it. All right. So yeah, Eva had talked about the other one. Um, related to that, um, I think in the chat, somebody asks, well, what if the parent uh, refuses consent um, to do that functional behavior assessment. Um, if it's part of a reevaluation, then you're just sort of in the realm of IEP process and evaluation process and procedure where, um, you know, you don't technically need parental consent for those reevaluation uh, procedures. So presuming it's a student that already has an IEP and you are being required by law to conduct an FBA as part of that manifestation determination or following um, a um, second seclusion or restraint. If it's part of a reevaluation, yes, absolutely work with the parent, um, work to obtain their consent and get them on board. It, the more they're involved in the process, the better, obviously. Um, but then you may be in a situation where, you know, you need to move ahead with the reevaluation, the FBA. Um, in the interest of that student, if they actively like decline consent, that's a different conversation. And then you are in a situation where you have to decide, can we try and figure this out without the assessments that we feel like we need to do um, based on the data and information we already have? Um, or are we in a situation where we where we need to go through sort of a, a, a work with a facilitated IEP process or um or through those other sort of conflict resolution processes that are available to parents, sometimes we forget that those are available to schools as well. And kind of going back to, to the CCR IEP five-step process, if you don't have consent, how much data were we able to collect through that IEP process um, as we were measuring progress on those IEP goals? And that might lead us to being more robust and how we document that going forward in that IEP to make sure that we're getting that good data around student progress um, and uh, embedding some of those tools into that annual IEP. Just as you're going through those uh, those those questions, I'll just add to that comment with regard to you know challenging a parent who's objectionable to a reevaluation or an evaluation. A lot of times, those uh, having those genuine discussions about the impact to their students' learning, long-term effects, and so forth, can kind of resolve that. It's tough to go to that mediation. Mediation is one thing. If it goes to the due process hearing, that's even tougher. But um, a lot of times, if you have those those close conversations with parents, what are the barriers? What are the things that they're actually maybe triggered on that uh, and boil that down? You can you really find a good resolution. But having good good thoughtful conversation is the first step. Uh, moving down to the next one in terms of discussion of adding functional behavior assessment or behavioral intervention. Um, BIP forms to the special ed documents. We've had conversations on it for sure. Um, I don't, I, I suspect as we update the FBA toolkit, that will again be a more specific, explicit part of the conversation. I know that's been something that's been requested by others um, as well, Tammy, that uh, it would be nice to have at least like sort of templates or sort of examples of what they could look like 
Um, I don't, I go back and forth on where I feel at, at the state level, what that should look like. Um, Cause it always goes back to, you know, in, in your local districts, like if we say this is the required form, but it doesn't fit quite as neatly into your processes and procedures and practices um, that are we, are we making people do a big shift that they would prefer not to do because they already have a system. So I guess personally, I would tend towards like, examples as opposed to required forms because again fbas are required uh, in those in that one limited circumstance as part of uh, um, idea but behavior intervention plans are not required so there there is a, a version of this where one district might think well we would like an fba form because we want to make sure we're documenting step by step what we're doing for those assessments but we don't want to do a separate behavior intervention plan. We just plan to embed all our interventions and supports into the IEP. Um, so mandating a, a shift in practices like that to me is oftentimes hard. But I guess the short answer to your question is yes, there have been and are ongoing discussions about how to best support districts in, in these processes. And one of the things we're talking about is do we have additional forms for FBA behavior intervention plans or not. And Tim, I would kind of just set aside, you had already put out one of your slides where you kind of <laughs> outlined for an FBA, not a, not a BIP, but an FBA, kind of a, a beginning. So, you know, developing your team, who should be included, um, uh, in, particularly in this case, the family, outlining the target behavior that you're really looking at and, and then further then using your processes to uh, fully understand some of the root cause analysis of, through root cause analysis, what you know what what's the cause of that behavior just a an outline of steps might be helpful too is another way to kind of look at it versus a, a hard and fast form oh dan you always ask the tough ones <laughs> uh this is the age old uh, does the student have any emotional behavioral disability if we can't demonstrate or document um, that the behaviors occur at home or in the community? Um, I think we sort of address this in our FAQ, do we not, Eva? Um, at least in a roundabout way, I think we do. Um, it's towards the beginning of the FAQ, and the question is sort of along the lines of, if we see these specific behaviors in school that are frequent and intense um, in both academic and non-academic settings, but a student demonstrates perhaps different behaviors at home or in the community, is that student a student with an emotional behavioral disability? And I, off the top of my head, I can't remember specifically what our FAQ says, but I believe it's along the lines of if the student demonstrates frequent and intense behaviors across settings, then the answer is yes. So I, so to me, I would want to dig deeper just because a parent says, well, they never run out of their bedroom at home while they're playing video games. So we don't see elopement. Well, are you gonna? No. Um, if they don't see ver verbal aggression at home, um, because the demands at home obviously are very different than they might be at school in terms of academic and social expectations and things. They might not demonstrate either of those things at home, but that doesn't mean they're not demonstrating different social, emotional, or behavioral challenges at home based on whatever sort of the, the characteristic is. So there might be students where you're seeing elopement and verbal aggression as a result of an emotional behavioral disability at school, whereas at home, those things might manifest as isolation, where if they're just sitting in their bedroom all day, every day, and not interacting with people, that might be a different manifestation of the same emotional behavioral disability. So you might be seeing different frequent intense behaviors that have the same sort of root cause based on the differences in the environments. I see a head nod from Dan. Does that mean my answer was fairly clear? <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not easy, but yeah, I, it's a hard one because you need to trust parents, right? And you need to have a good relationship with them. And they, most of the time are probably being honest that well, we're not seeing these things at home. Well, then you got to start digging deeper and saying, well, why? 
Um, and there might be some clues as to, well, what's different about school? And if the answer is, well, they only behave this way when we put academic demands on them, and that's sort of the identification of what's going on, then the team has to have a discussion about, is this an emotional behavioral disability or not? Um, or is it like, is it just this weakness in academic that changes your your sort of calculation of what sort of interventions and supports they need, not to mention whether or not it's an emotional behavioral disability or something else. I think we answered that one, Tim, about the consent. Do we have that one? Yeah. And then the last one is about the permission for a brief or complex FBA. Um, and yeah, we that's we you do need to also get parent consent for a brief FBA. IDEA doesn't recognize brief FBA, but the PBI, the National Center on PBIS, does recommend that you get consent even for that brief FBA. So does that pretty much, I haven't been following along, I've been distracted by other things. We've we've come to the situation where all the questions that have been submitted through the chat and um, through the uh, uh, the parking lot document have been kind of touched on. Any other questions, you could go ahead and click on your mics, ask a question live, throw it in the chat if you'd like, if you prefer. So we, we still have a little bit of time. And I don't know that we got to this one from CISO okay. 7, Steve. Um, is a behavioral intervention plan part of the IEP or a standalone plan? Um, if the behavioral intervention plan is, is the result of that evaluation process and is part of the IEP or is designed to meet disability-related needs, then yes, it is part of the IEP, needs to be clearly documented as such somewhere in the official IEP forms that there is a behavioral intervention plan attached uh, and it does need to be included or attached. Now, if you are referring, and this is sort of gets to semantics a little bit, but let's say you have a student problem solving team, whatever you might call them in your school, um, your RTI team or PBIS team that is meeting regularly, reviewing sort of your school level or classroom level or district level data. And the teacher says, well, this student's really struggling with such and such behavior. We're gonna meet as our you know, building intervention team or our PBIS team, whatever that might be. We're gonna talk about the kid a little bit and come up with some intervention supports and strategies. That kind of behavior intervention plan that's not based on an FBA and not for a student with an IEP, well, then obviously it's just a, a, a standalone plan or a, as a, in the chat, a supplemental plan. Uh, for everyone's sanity, I might call that something different, like a student support plan or a behavior support plan or something different, just, to, just so it's clear um, that when we're talking about a specific plan based on an FBA that's that's for a student with an IEP, that it's part of the IEP. Tim, I see oh. there's one more dropped in below that now. <laughs> I should stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> You've given him more time to think. <laughs> So what if a parent refuses, because I think we've kind of touched on this once before, but so what if a parent refuses consent for FBA uh, because uh, they don't have these issues at home? And we've touched on that, but I, I think that's a consummate concern. Um, any Chuck, further thoughts to add on that? Chuck, I know we did touch on it. I'm actually just grabbing the ones from the chat and sticking them in the parking lot so that they're gotcha. easy for people to go back and refer to. Gotcha. Uh, because you. once the recording is watched again, we can drop responses in here. Okay, Tim or Eva, this is Trish Tyke Miller from Lack to Flambeau, and I've got a couple of questions to follow up from one of mine that I had had in there. Um, if we are doing a brief or complex FBA, or regardless, just an FBA as part of the MLSS system, not as part, not for a student um, who's been identified with a disability, um, we should have some kind of forms that that are asking permission from parents to do the FBA. Am, am I clear on that? 
I'm not talking brief, like, Trish, for a brief FBA, are you talking about? Yes. Yes, there should be some kind of consent and even the National PBIS Center. If you look at um, the bulletin, um, the Center on PBS has a tier three brief functional behavioral assessment guide and they also say there that you need that consent. Okay, so that's even for students that are not under the umbrella of a disability. All right. Um, and then my next question is, um, and maybe I'm just thinking too much about this, but when I think about the evaluation process and once we're doing a reeval and and your your suggestion, Eva, was to definitely look at um, at all of the criteria to make sure that that basically that they're requalifying. If you're going, if you're doing this deep dive for FBA, you might as well do that. So what in the, what about um, in, in like cases where, I know that this would be rare, but I, I can say that it probably will happen to, in schools and probably to ours, because that's, that's how we roll. But where we've gotten and we've gone through an evaluation process, and maybe it's like three months or four months down the line. And you know, certainly the student is getting those services, but suddenly behaviors have come up and they've been significant and we want to do an FBA. So we're going to have to call a reeval to get permission to do that FBA. But going through all of that paperwork, you know, the ER1, is that what you're suggesting that that's what schools need to do? Is go through and, re and complete all of that paperwork again and go through and, and re- um, re-identify the areas that the student meets criteria, even though the, the reason why we're doing it is simply to get the information from the FBA. And of course, make some changes to the IEP or or to criteria if it, it comes up, I mean, sorry, or to identification, identification if that fits. But am I the only one that just feels like that? That is like, we're, we're overwhelmed. I, I don't know how that's, that's something that seems realistic. So those are just my two cents. I know you guys are the the just the messengers, but maybe there's an easier or different way to do this and still have, you know, legally having us cover what we need to cover. There's a great suggestion from Brenda in the chat about having it as a way to measure goals. And again, if you can embed that into the IEP, that would be already there all that information would be collected and yeah. we and you're not the only one trish i mean we hear that repeatedly the concern about people are overwhelmed understaffed um it's a lot and we recognize that we really do but again recognizing that it's a pretty intensive intrusive process um I, you know i don't i don't have another a good answer for that you know yeah. we recognize that it's a lot. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, to me, several different layers <laughs> to trying to answer that question, because uh, on the one hand, um, and Trish, you said you're, you're in lack to flambeau. Yeah. Um, which, I, uh, you know, uh, which is, uh, you know, an area of the state that is certainly, you know, uh, understaffed and, and, and has, a different layer of challenges. But to me, you know, you go back to those three things to consider when you're thinking about FBAs. What is the intent of this assessment and process? What are the parents' and students' rights when we're doing these things? And what are our child find obligations? Um, what you sort of want to balance is the intensity of your assessment and interventions should really match sort of the, the level and in-depthness of what you're doing. So when we say FBA, we're talking about a really in-depth process that really is part of an evaluation. If there are other processes and procedures in place for student problem solving, uh, culturally responsive problem solving process, RTI, PBIS teams, whatever that might be, those are a different category. Those are not a functional behavior assessment. So it's kind of reverse engineering when we say an FBA is an assessment process that is part of an evaluation. Think about that as a really high level of really in-depth analysis of doing an evaluation. Whereas if you're talking about a student, you're doing a problem solving process um, to just try and meet student needs at that sort of lower level of intensity, well, that's different. So yes, 
when we recognize, and you're certainly not the only one, I, I I hear it pretty regularly about like the big hang up with this or the big struggle that that we hear is we're just redoing paperwork that's redundant and it's it's not a good use of our time. And, and we're certainly aware of that and acknowledge that. Um, so if you're doing other processes that use components of an FBA, but are not sort of that really in-depth, it's going to it's not going to change services, change supports, things like that in the IEP. Uh, that's a different process that that we just wouldn't call FBA. Um, now, the other sort of, in terms of cultural responsiveness reason that, that it is important to make sure you get that consent, even if it is like not a um, an IEP or an evaluation process, it's not a student with an IEP, um, is that you certainly don't want teams to just stop at the point in lack of flambeau where they say, well, the issue here is the student's poverty. The issue here is the student doesn't have the resources. We The, the problem here is just this, this uh, generational historical community-wide trauma um, in our native population. You don't just want to stop there and say that's the problem. That leads to this, what, what some of our culturally responsive guidance talks about, in terms of you don't want to stop at those untrue, unalterable. Uh, oh, I'm missing the last one, Eva. Untrue, unalterable, unfounded, unfounded. unfounded attributions of behavior that um, you want to make sure you're really trying to get to the true root cause of behaviors and ways that you can actually and things that you can actually as a school, as a as a staff, as an IEP team can do something about to support the student. You know, Tim, the, uh, thank you for that response. And I think there's there's a similar question from Bonnie in the chat that states, what is the function of the behavior? What is the function of the behavior is related to a, uh, related to a mental health issue, possible bipolar, for example. It is difficult for parents to get uh, kids into a psychiatrist and schools can't diagnose. You know, there's 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 that um, can be a challenge as well. Uh, there's several other kind of questions. They just keep rolling in in the chat. So you really need to stop talking. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say sort of the mental health diagnosis is the same thing. Um, there might be some useful sort of more in-depth stuff on that in our emotional behavioral disability um, recorded webinars and FAQ. Um, that's another area where, you know, a mental health diagnosis is not sort of a rule in or rule out for special education eligibility. Um, supporting students' mental health needs is not um, separate from special education all the time. We can certainly um, implement and provide supports and strategies for mental health challenges in IEPs. Um, that doesn't mean we provide mental health therapy through an IEP, but um, that is certainly something that that there's a lot of overlap between emotional behavioral disabilities and mental health challenges. We know that. Um, similar to trauma, we know there's a decent amount of overlap between students who have emotional behavioral disabilities and students who have experienced trauma. It's not an either or, but it's a it, it's a thing that teams need to consider both that. A student can have these behavioral challenges and it can be related to a mental health challenge. It can be related to those other factors. It can be related to trauma. Um, that doesn't mean that there's a separate thing over here that addresses trauma and mental health and then special education's over here. Um, there's enough overlap where there is some sort of ways that we need to be sort of unsiloed and address those things together because we know there's overlap. And providing those supports through that student's IEP. And again, like Tim said, it's not providing the therapy, but it's providing some instruction around, maybe it's identifying, you know, your thoughts and feelings, some and, and aligning it with some, you know, cognitive behavioral um, instructional practices, cognitive behavioral therapy um, within that IEP to help that child make the connection between thoughts, feelings, and behavior or providing just safe places for a student if they're really dysregulated or, or a safe adult to go to. Um, we can certainly do a lot to provide mental health support through that IEP, um, but we're not mental health providers, like Tim said. It's all about reducing the barriers, right? The barriers to learning. 
and and what we can influence and what we can can support with yes and i think that i mean when we think about learning too not just learning academics right sure. but just that sense of safety and belonging within that school setting you know making sure we're really building those relationships to provide that safety and sense of belonging to that child for that student um in, in any ways that we can yeah um and there's a couple of things in the chat um i think Eva touched on this one briefly. Can an FBA be listed as a form for uh, checking progress on goals? And then there's another one from Brad. Uh, it says ID, IDEA says informed consent. If a meeting is held, parent agrees to an FBA and the team documents it in writing um, and provides the parent with notice. Isn't this sufficient? Um, when it comes, to, Eva mentioned when it comes to emotional behavioral disability reevaluations. Um, and the same can be said for functional behavior assessment. So yeah, one of our early, one of my early conversations um, with school psychologists, somebody had mentioned, you know, I have a parent that every spring requests an FBA be done with their child. Can I just put that into the IEP so we don't have to do a reevaluation every year? Our, our goal here isn't to create more paperwork or more barriers on, on your end to meet students' needs. Um, so I would say, yes, I don't know that I would just write in the progress monitoring FBA. Um, but if you're documenting things like observations and interviews as ways to monitor progress towards IEP goals, um, then yes, that's that's a great way to sort of have the uh, sort of ongoing FBA going. And you may or may not call it an FBA, but if that's your progress monitoring and that's your vehicle for meeting that student's needs, that's, that's great. Um, and especially because we think about students who have an IEP, let's say we write a great IEP and we provide these great services and we do our interventions and, and we've we've nailed that function of the behavior and now we're not seeing that behavior anymore, but now this new behavior is popping up, right? Doing a whole new reeval, doing all those things may not make perfect sense. So yeah, embedding it in the IEP long-term is a fantastic strategy. Like universally long-term, that's, that's probably a fantastic strategy to sort of embed those sort of ongoing assessment processes into the into what your systems do. So Tim, this is Trish again. Um, so along that same line, if we're doing a manifestation determination and need to do an FBA, will that be sufficient if we have that embedded into our IEP? It's a really so good question. Nope. No, I, I, we love this. Like I said, even I are sort of in the process of really getting going on updating our FBA toolkit. So we want feedback and information and things. So this is great for us too. So um, yeah, I guess what I would say is your, let's say it's a scenario where your, um, uh, the special factors form, you didn't check the box that says, you know, did the team conduct a functional behavior assessment? Um, again, there's no definition of FBA. So let's say you have an IEP that has progress monitoring embedded in it where you're monitoring the goals with observations and interviews. You may even have like brief behavioral checklists that you're doing sort of on an annual basis when you're doing the annual IEP updates. That can be embedded as uh, progress monitoring. You're obviously getting like teacher input. Um, your functional behavior assessment you, if you think about it in terms of a reevaluation, you may teams get to decide: Do we have the data we need, or do we need consent to perform additional assessments? You may get to the table and go, "We we've got all the information we need. We don't need to conduct additional assessments." And then you then you're done with the actual assessment part of the FBA. If you already have all the data you need, you may have not done the FBA where you took all that data as a team and sat and looked at it together and said, "We think this is the function of the behavior." But yeah, it's a it's a definitely a way to make it more efficient and talk about the data that you have. But it would still be that we would be we would be doing a reeval with no additional assessment needed, correct? Okay, yeah. and still filling out all the ER one forms. Yes. Okay. I, I think so. Yes. <laughs> all right. Eva's nodding her head as well. It looks like. This is really actually really good information and feedback, even through your questions. Um, Cause again, our, our, we're, we're not trying to make things harder on you. <laughs> In fact, we're trying to do the opposite. 
I just think, Kim, that there would be an easier way to do this because I think we're all in a similar situation where we could legally be covering what we needed to, and most importantly, getting the information we need to to really develop the best programming for a student, but do it in a way that isn't so taxing on everybody else. There's got to be a way that DPI can come up with, you know, a different, maybe a different set of forms or something where we're doing what we need to legally, getting the information. And it's, again, I, you know, not so overwhelming. So I'm just putting it out there. From somebody who has manifestation determinations all the time, like I think I've had seven in the last month, that it's it's a lot. This is a lot. Wow. I I just want to add something. I think that all of us and I like it. I know in my district, what I'm going to struggle struggle with is staff are going to find reasons to avoid doing an FBA. And so I'm going to have to try to like hold people accountable to like, nope, we do need to do an FBA. And so that's what I'm going to see in my little district. And I'm going to bet that that's going to be a pattern seen across the state too, that some, they'll, they'll just be more of that. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm assuming that the purpose of making some of these changes is that, um, you know, probably litigation has maybe caused some of this. For, so I, I understand that there's a purpose. I just think that that will be a pattern that I know I'll have to work against in my district. And I think that there'll be a pattern across the state of Wisconsin. Not that it means that FBAs won't be done. I would just assume that there would be less of them because, you know, I'm just catching, I'm catching my staff if they're trying to avoid. So in, in big districts, that's going to happen. So just that's something that I think I'll see. Final questions for Eva or Tim. And by the way, Tim and Eva, we've been, uh, and thank you to Rachel or, and my team, they've been putting all the questions that even what came from the chat into the uh, parking lot document, because I think it's good data for you and the both of you as you look forward to your toolkit and developing uh, those further resources. So um, that'll be helpful to you, but. Any last questions? Melanie writes, redoing in the chat, redoing the FBA versus adjusting the BIP. Yeah, that's the CCRIP process. That certainly could and should be a first step. That's what sort of I was just long-windedly explaining is that if you have those ongoing progress monitoring assessments, you could have a review revise meeting and say, we've got a pretty good idea of what we think we're seeing now, based on the data we've already collected, let's just revise the IEP without as having as it, to do a full FBA. As long as it doesn't change placement, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely what you're saying is embedding, is embedding it in the IEP is probably the most streamlined approach in terms of the ability to be flexible down the road without, without creating, as Trish points out, which by the way, I, I feel, I feel, Trish, what you shared with the number of manifests that you're you're dealing with, um, and I saw a lot of other head shakes and people going, "Oh my God, this is this is this pervasive right now," and feeling a little bit out of control. So, if you anything we can do to support uh, districts across the state to do a quality, you know, job of of really digging through the minutia and trying to figure out what are the disability related needs and the ultimately the needs of the student in a in a streamlined approach and a streamlined fashion, the better. Any final questions? I keep seeing the numbers coming up in the chat. I don't know whether it's a thank you. Well done, thank you. Yes, all right, we're getting there. Well, we certainly want to thank you both. I mean, even though this is, we are about 10 minutes ahead uh, of our plan time together, I think we've really exhausted uh, not only our, all of our capacities, but are also uh, gotten to a point where I think all the questions have been asked. So I think one of the things for me, uh, Eva and Tim, is that's really critically important is to understand why the eval piece, we, we get it because um, the reality is, is that 
for one thing, it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be done and include include in parents' perspective um, because they have uh, footnotes and things with regard to cultural components or even the ecological factors um, that 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 in is needed. And but still, I think uh, the consistent voice here is is how can we make sure that we complete these, include all those factors in a way that's not overwhelming and overtaxing to the system. And I really want to say that I spent more time personally in the last few months looking at the riot and ISIL frameworks to help look at those ecological factors to really use them as a way to tease out some of those things that uh, that maybe be influences or factors of why in a particular given moment of the day or place, why is this happening here but not there and then very informative to the team so I can't encourage that that enough to really use those those tools very very valuable so any last questions comments anything else we can we can uh, basically continue to abuse Eva and Tim with <laughs> and I use that term lightly I'm just kidding thank you have a good yes. Thanksgiving yes well, that said, thank you so much, Tim and Eva. It's always a pleasure. We appreciate your time. Certainly those of you that have dropped additional questions into the chat, into the, excuse me, the chat and or the uh, parking lot document, we're going to um, continue to work on giving you full robust answers there. So you might want to go ahead and, and bookmark that document. Very valuable um, going forward. So again, thank you so much. We look forward to the toolkit. We look forward to further discussions on FBAs as we build our strengths and capacities across our state to to continue to meet the needs of our students so thank you tim and eva thank you enjoy your well-deserved thanksgiving break everyone yeah and with that i'm going to say thank you on behalf of all, all of our organizations that support these sessions thank you for attending today our next session is scheduled for december 6th that's a two-hour session uh beginning at 10 a.m and we're we're going to discuss open enrollment and joint federal federal uh, notification package release. So um, good information to talk about there. Um, also, the uh, uh, registration for the December 6th meeting is at the bottom of today's agenda. And again, I'm going to say, as, as Echo Tim, the happy Thanksgiving to you all. Uh, enjoy your time with family and friends. And even if, in, and aside from that, if you're a, one of the uh, a hunter across our state, be safe, be well, and uh, take care, everybody. Thanks.